In the first part of this two-part documentary, I talked about the size of the gap between contemporary art and many, many people. If you remember, I suggested that maybe the reason why galleries and museums struggle to switch more people on to what they're up to is that people aren't switched off to begin with and that differing notions of quality seem to set the art world at odds with what many people find interesting or beautiful. But is there really no common ground? Of course, I'm not the first person to try to put my finger on these issues. Almost 50 years ago now, John Berger proposed that we have been divorced from art, partly because photographic reproductions of it have had the effect of thinning out its meaning, and because the enormous sums of money being paid for much of it creates a sense of shock and awe, which keeps us from more intimate connections with a work like this one by Leonardo da Vinci. It's acquired a kind of new impressiveness, but not because of what it shows, not because of the meaning of its image. It's become mysterious again because of its market value. First broadcast in 1972, John Berger's Ways of Seeing documentary broke new ground and opened up a debate, continued by Robert Hughes and many, many others, about the distancing effect of advertising culture and big money on art. Here people could stroll about and enjoy the sensation of being in the Church of Art without actually being obliged to pray. If ever a museum set up a building whose main function was to praise its own stature as an institution, this was it. But what I'm proposing is that some aesthetic instincts run far deeper than anyone has realised, and that consequently the real challenges facing the contemporary art world in terms of its relevance to many people's lives derive not from internal art world politics, but from the consequences of exactly what the art world has rejected as trivial. Uh, I think people look at things and if they look realistic, people think, wow, that's really good. If a drawing looks like the object or whatever, yeah. then it's really good. And most of like, my classmates, family, I think everyone's got the same idea. The idea is, is that skill and like, quality is marked by realism and how real you can make it, how like your reference you can make it. It's important to point out that I'm not advocating for a return to traditional techniques or even for realism as a dominant notion of artistic quality. But I do think an instinct toward images we recognise made by hand is more or less fundamental and that consequently many people are unsatisfied. But tackling these very old issues is problematic to an art world that was founded, at least in part, from the assumption that photography had made realistic depiction by hand obsolete. So, going back and addressing these problems properly would seem to have to involve rewriting at least some of the base code of contemporary art as we know it. But let's not forget that we've also enjoyed 150 years of dazzling innovation. Freed from depiction, artists have invented new ways of seeing and of looking at the world. But with the instinct toward depiction written out of its DNA, fundamentally the art world has no prism through which to interpret the motives that keep people away from contemporary art museums and moving toward skill, craftsmanship, and in the truest sense, the recognisable. But could it be fair to say that an instinct to want to see images we recognise made by another human hand is a bit immature, something to be gotten past? Well quite possibly yes, but let's not forget as well that an instinct to want to remake the world so that others will know that we have seen it as they have has been with us for over 30,000 years.
And if you want to get a sense of the detachment that grows when people aren't able to do what Picasso did and move beyond the challenges of realism, not by sidestepping, but through a feeling of having conquered them, you only need to go and talk to a high school art teacher. But it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, they will look at somebody else's drawing or painting and, and compare themselves. Yeah. And if they don't feel that theirs is that the same standard, they give up. And that's based on it looking accurate, accurate, realistic. Always accurate, always realistic, looking like something. The problem then would seem to be clear. A pervasive consensus amongst teenagers that a realistic drawing or painting is the hallmark of creative talent leads many students to become disenfranchised. And if these students don't re-engage, it's easy to imagine how they would become the next generation of adults divorced from art and from a sense of themselves as creative. Trying to tap in, but finding the time to do that. To tap in yeah. to every student yeah, would take a lot of time. time. Don't have time, because you're teaching yeah. not just necessarily skills, but you're teaching ideas, and that's the biggest thing. This is an enormous problem, which persists and is rarely talked about because, in large part, teaching the skills of realistic drawing and painting in the time that curriculums allow is more or less impossible. Nevertheless, to get an idea of the strength of the desire to find answers to the questions of realism, we only need to go online and look at the popularity of painting tutorial channels like this one by James Gurney. It seems to me that because the world is composed of big shapes and little fine lines that it's good to get that variety within a painting. In his channel, James invites us into his process. We ride with him every step of the way. It's teaching by example, really, and it's an example of what can happen if a good teacher is freed from having to beat the clock. Above all, James never seems to over-instruct. Instead, we have the space and the time to come to terms with what he's actually up to. And over time, this creates a feeling that maybe we could try doing something like that ourselves. It's also possible to teach the skills of realism and to speed things up by breaking it down into simple, comprehensible chunks. And one of the best exponents of this kind of teaching in my book is Mark Carter. So I'm going to do a demonstration and show you guys how to mix uh, any color in the world with oil paint using a simple palette. And I've got three colors that I'm going to mix. Again, Mark is an excellent teacher and a very experienced painter. But he's also invented several bits of hardware, which streamline some of the processes around the actual business of applying paint. Like a colour checker, which allows us to tackle the problems of tone and colour before even beginning to pick up a brush. Paint it onto this part right here. And then you look through it and match your colour like this. In different ways, Mark and James are exemplars of best practice, as far as conventional teaching methods are concerned. But to date, the only way to speed up the skills of realistic drawing and painting enough to make them fully accessible to every child in a class of 14-year-olds would be to use an optical painting aid. Several reworkings of these devices have come on the market recently, but after some close inspection it transpires that they are all iterations of the Camera Lucida, the Camera Obscura, or the Epidioscope. Each of these devices presents no more than a projection, into which it's possible to trace a convincing line image, and even to approach some of the problems of tone and colour, and for a while, I entertained the idea of using these devices to tackle the problems of realism in the classroom. But my experiences were mirrored by those of the children I spoke to, who told me that whichever way you approach it, tracing into a projection 
is a pretty brainless activity when you boil it down. And that the little device at the centre of Tim Jennison's research into Vermeer seems to offer something different. I mean, if you think back to that experience with the camera Lucida, Mm. Were there any differences between that process and the camera at the uh, comparator mirror? Definitely. <laughs> the um, camera Lucida gave you the image on the paper that you were drawing on. You had it an outline basically, so you could trace it. Uh, whereas the comparator mirror gives you the image for you to interpret on your own and just makes that interpretation a smoother process. Right. So it's not feeding you the image, it's kind of showing you and suggesting it to yeah. you. I think that was the major difference. And this was the result of Tim's experiment. It took him five hours. This is why I've spent so much time and effort researching Tim Jennison's comparator mirror as a teaching aid. Not bad for a first oil painting. Yeah. At first, with West Buckland School in Devon, and then with five further schools across the UK. What you've just seen in those two clips are student reactions to exactly what you are seeing here. A mirror is reflecting a source image, so that it appears coincident with, and coplanar to, the surface on which you are painting which is the scientific way of describing what you can see instinctively here, can't you? The time and distance between seeing what you want to paint and painting it has simply been reduced. And so, for almost everyone, the prospect of working a brush at the edge of that mirror, moving back and forth and building a recognisable, realistic drawing or painting through your own comparisons, your own decisions, suddenly becomes a possibility. And across my tests, that sense of possibility was enough in many cases to get struggling students back in the game. Like with tracing, it's more, you're just like not taking someone else's work, but yeah. it's not your own, but this feels like it's more your own work. You still have to do it yourself. You're not just copying it exactly. You still have to compare between the mirror and your photo and make adjustments. And because we're painting by straight comparison, rather than tracing into a projection of any kind, the comparator mirror is unique in allowing us to tackle and solve all three of the problems that make up a realistic drawing or painting in the traditional way. These are the problems of tone, the problems of shape, and the problems of colour. To be clear, no other device in the history of art has allowed us to do this. And in purely technical terms, that is what makes the comparator mirror the only complete painting aid. Well, that's what it is. But how students would react toward Tim Jennison's breakthrough was a different question. I've been trying to stay skeptical about all of this, but until now, with the possible exception of Vermeer and Tim Jennison's painstaking reenactment, learning that paint was a language and then having the confidence to become fluent could only really be achieved by knuckling down and doing your 10,000 hours of practice. And this raises a fundamentally important question. Can it be right to make something as beautifully complex as painting so simple? And is simplicity the same thing as accessibility? Uh, in terms of making a picture, it was uh, torture. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I spoke to many of my painter colleagues, including Julian Perry here, most of them suggested that the comparator mirror probably isn't much good if you're trying to create art. But 
that said, anything that enables people to go from virtually no experience and to paint that picture of that Rembrandt mm. um, must have been a very positive experience for her. A spectacular, beautiful, you know, really, yeah. really good. But it's the conversations we could have about Rembrandt after the event or sort of in the tail end of the process that were much more impressive to me than yeah. the painting. What I think you're hinting at is that the value doesn't lie in the painting, it lies in the process. suspect you've got to have uh, a context in which the, the person using it looks at what they're doing and uh, decides what's good or bad about what they're, what they're getting out of the machine. Yeah. What Julian suggests there has been a guiding principle for me throughout, really. By about 2015, I could see that the comparator mirror would make the skills of realistic drawing and painting accessible but watching to see if it unlocked understanding for every child in a class of 14-year-olds, that was the make-or-break issue. And so I decided to start playing devil's advocate, to try to get a real sense of what each student's experience with the device had really been. And that they, they just think that they can't. But don't you think it might be a bit dangerous if you sort of make it a cheap trick? Well, you know, so no. you can do it quickly and then that's a bit of a cheat. No, because I don't, I don't think it's um, so that you can do it quickly. I think it's so that you can give them more hope that they can do it. I thought it was going to be really difficult. Yeah. But when I actually went to go and do it, it wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. Okay, and you, did your confidence grow as a result? Yeah. Yeah. But it was kind of like you're not looking at what you're drawing, you're looking at the part next to it. Yeah. So it wasn't, I didn't feel like cheating. But you still had a sense that it was your picture? Yeah. Yeah. And then I looked at the photo we were uh, meant to be painting and I thought I'm never going to be able to do that. Um, but then I just started working from, you know, the eye, the eye outwards. It's definitely made me feel a little bit more confident. Um, yeah, I think it was quite nice to just go there and paint. To me, this seems like a big deal. What my tests since 2016 have shown is that whilst the comparator mirror makes the trick of realism accessible, using it still feels authentic for students because it leaves room for individual decision making and for creative problem solving. The complexities of paint and of painting do not go away underneath the surface of that mirror. And, as I would discover, it could be a shared experience with the teacher. Let's now talk about creative freedom and return to the problem of whether or not the comparator mirror has allowed students to develop that all-important understanding. If we take a look at this series of paintings made by students in their very first workshop at Aylesbury Grammar School, the first thing we see is that despite being asked to work from the same source photograph, none of these paintings is the same. The next thing we see is that none of these paintings is photographically realistic, but that each student, in their way, is discovering how to solve the problems of tone, shape and colour. I think they were inquisitive about uh, what they had in front of them, the equipment. It was accessible after looking at the, watching the video and your, your brief introduction. And largely they got on with it themselves, so I think that really speaks for, for itself. Yeah. 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 In a classroom situation with 27 children, it would potentially free a teacher up? French, potentially free a teacher up. Obviously we did it over a two hour period, but they still in the one hour got quite a lot done. And yeah. you know, um, yes, d definitely, yeah. And did you notice that they were learning? Did, did you yes, see them absolutely, absolutely. Looking at shape, um, exploring where 
paint needed to be pushed in different directions, lifting paint, some of these things they ha perhaps haven't been taught but they adapted to, to that very quickly, mm. yes. And the mirror seemed to explain that to them? Yes, I think they could definitely see where, um, where they'd overstretched on some of the shapes, um, where some of them were using the background to define shapes and they were, they were looking at other they're exploring other ways that they could define shape other yeah. than just going right into the, um, the, sh uh, the details of the skull. They were using the, the, the negative space, which was great, yeah. Yeah. which wasn't explained to them when they were doing it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. By about 2018, I was really starting to get a sense that I was dialing in a method. What's your name? Zach. Zach. Zach said, um, with tracing, all of them, you can have 30 people do it and all of them will be the same. With this, none of them yeah, yeah. You, this, this is where my research really gets its weight. It's from you guys coming back to me and saying things like that. When students notice that for themselves, that's when I know it's really working. In each class, it was a great feeling of liftoff, really. And all because each student seemed to be able to unlock the mysteries of realism for themselves. And I could understand each student's decision making with no more than a quick glimpse over each mirror. So the only reason it's difficult is that in that few half a second of movement, most people forget. But it turns out that I think if you reduce the distance between seeing the thing you want to paint and painting it, it suddenly becomes more accessible. But I can't be sure of this unless I take it to schools and treat you guys like serious parts of this research and you give me your honest feedback. But results like this were only starting to become possible following a process of prior trial and error, which had begun four years before at West Buckland School. So, to test my progress, and to keep myself in check, I began to send kits out to teachers and individuals all across the world. It took a lot of time to arrange all 10 compared to mirrors. It was so time consuming that I hadn't a lot of time to speak with my students and to make a lot of observation. Well, my first approach to this leg of the research could barely be called a strategy really. And whilst they looked fantastic, my first prototypes were a bit inconsistent. It's looking great, Bill. Thank you. I love this. Oh, good. <laughs> but within about six months, an improvement in the hardware, so that it would guarantee the correct angles needed for the comparator mirror to work properly, saw a surge in positive results that seemed to be more and more in line with my own findings. And how did your confidence feel after 20 minutes? Um, much better. Like I feel quite excited about it rather than um, a, a bit frightened. It opened up an opportunity to do something I'd lost touch with. I had taken some lessons from a neighborhood lady back when I was 12 or 13 and I got discouraged with it and I just stopped doing it. And 50 years later I found the comparator and I gave it a try and I was able to paint a portrait of my grandson um, in about a week. It's unlocked uh, an ability for me to do things that I didn't think I would be able to do ever. Uh, so I think it's fabulous. Allowing others to use and to teach with the comparator mirror has shown me just how important a thorough workshop strategy really is as well as a standardised comparator mirror kit that takes care of all the variables, leaving teachers and users feeling free to enjoy that new sense of potential. In fact, I believe that it is only by doing this that teachers and individuals everywhere will be able to make constructive use of the device's full potential. And if we're going to dispel some of the myths around realism, that's what we need. Just take a look at the difference of opinion when this sort of stuff is properly taken care of. Uh, so the part that we were getting um, into tone, this was an amazing tool. It really meshed very well with my regular kind of um, 
self-teaching program. The little time I've spent with a comparator mirror has brought me so much more creative satisfaction. I think the comparator mirror is giving me the skills to create art um, filtered through me. It's encouraging stuff. Based on six years of research then, I think it's about time I came to some concrete conclusions here. Of course, to me, this is the real meat in the sandwich. But if you want to skip forward and see the biggest breakthrough with the comparator mirror of all, I won't hold it against you. The first thing I'll say is that universally, without exception, the comparator mirror made the challenge of realistic drawing and painting comprehensible to any student who looked over the top of the mirror. Which, as we'll see in a minute, is not at all the same thing as rolling up your sleeves and applying paint. But that understanding in and of itself is enough to do something quite significant, I think. Because when you understand how something is done, you begin to make different value judgments about it. And because, as we've seen, teenagers use the skills of realistic drawing and painting so often to judge what is worth looking at and who has creative talent. This would seem to be a game-changer. Secondly, across all of my tests, students display a sense of ownership about the paintings they are making and defend the process against my accusations of tracing or cheating. This would seem to indicate that there is an inherent authenticity in the process, and it is this which, in my experience, eclipses the sudden thrill of making a realistic painting or drawing, leading to the sorts of boosts in confidence that the individuals interviewed for this film have described. Thirdly, if this confidence is well managed, a sense of deep personal authority about drawing and painting seems to germinate. But this all depends upon teaching the language of paint with confidence, through and away from the notion of realism as quality. The fourth point is that most significantly, if workshops are properly prepared and structured, as I plan to explain in my next video, it is possible to achieve all of the above in the time that curriculums allow. And this means, I think, that it is right to describe the comparator mirror as doing for art what the calculator has done for mathematics. Lastly, this project has always been concerned with building authentic creative confidence for every child in the class, but I have never tried to make it or considered it to be a project about the creation of art. Now I'd like to talk about those students who struggle most and why, in the end, it was these pupils who revealed the true potential of the comparator mirror as a teaching aid. I'm not sure what, but something is definitely happening. These were the children who backed away as workshops began to take flight and gain momentum. They had seen the same potential in the device as other students, and liked the look of it, but had decided it was safer to say, I can't, I won't, I shouldn't. It's not in the right place. It would have been very easy to dismiss this as typical teenage behaviour, but instead, I considered that perhaps the complexity of paint, which had made the process feel authentic to the majority, was causing a small minority to stop dead. The genius of the comparator mirror is that looking over the top of it seems to make clear just how straightforward observational drawing and painting has always been, in an instant. But it's a big mistake to believe that this is game, set and match, because the business of picking up paints and a brush and beginning to act on this new sense of comprehension is a second, separate challenge. 
So, is simplicity the same thing as accessibility? Well, no, in this case, because whilst the mirror had made the challenge of realistic painting accessible, it had thrown down the gauntlet, students felt it was authentic precisely because painting under the mirror was still not simple. But now, with these struggling, disenfranchised pupils, simplification seemed like the only remedy. Can you see the difference in the sort of the sunlight? Yeah, know, yeah. The and so, we worked in tandem, taking turns, and in each turn, making only one or two brush marks each, with an encouragement to think about each brush mark as a decision. There was a terrible potential here to start eroding the authenticity of the process by rounding the corners of paint's complexity. But then I remembered something much more important. Fundamentally, a painting is never more than the aggregate effect of multiple decisions. When 20, or 500, or 20,000 decisions are made with integrity and a bit of intelligence toward a final outcome, you begin to get into the territory of what might reasonably be called good painting. But in instances like this, my last-ditch attempts to involve struggling students in the workshop have led me back to consider an entirely new way to teach something about the very essence of painting, from the decision upward. Yeah, I can see exactly how that fits. Let's bring out the shape of his lips. All right, so what I want you to do is choose something and put it in as just as roughly as I've done. You kind of get it into more of a rhythm and kind of flow of like one brush, one brush, get the color right, match the color up and slowly kind of build it up and then you can really start to see things come together. Mm -hmm. Was I helpful in what I was Yeah, doing? yeah, precisely. It was good to get, so say if I did one area and then you help me along for the other, that might boost me in another part of painting. And kind of, that goes in tandem and just continues. Mm. So you would make two brush marks, then I would make two brush marks, you'd make two brush marks, I'd make two brush marks. And then vice versa, mm. we got to a point where it was like, I'll spend about a minute on it, you spend about a minute on it, slowly sort of increasing the time that we get. It was really good, I really enjoyed it. So did it feel like cheating? Not, not really in its own sense, it was more like just a sort of a helping hand. It's sort of like a learning tool that might help you move on to doing it without the mirror. Do you think? Mm, yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. See this dark area? I'm going to push it back that way. Just have a look and see whether or not you think you're right about that. The objectivity of the comparator mirror has seen Tim Jennison come in for heavy criticism from time to time. The relationship between subjectivity and beauty is a sacred one, but I'm not sure that's ever really been at stake. In my tests, working with a student in tandem, with an objective means of comparison mediating between our two subjective impulses, let's call this objective mutual comparison, leads to a recognisable painting, certainly, but more importantly to a sense of common understanding between teacher and student, which simply wasn't possible before.
Which bits are you really struggling with? Do you feel like you're struggling with most? Maybe this sort of front door. In here? Yeah. And so, in the end, it was those students who struggled most. There's so many things here that show me that you are learning how paint behaves. Who ended up exposing the comparative mirror's true potential as a tool for empathy. So um, as soon as I saw the paint and like the mirror, I already knew that, oh no, I can't do this. One brush mark, two brush marks, three brush marks. Just have a look over the mirror and see if you can understand why I've done what I've done. Oh, I see. Yeah? I think, yeah. Above all, it presents a means with which to understand someone else's decisions. Watching you do it while you were doing it and then seeing how you saw it in the mirror, it was more like the very clear guide to what to do. Yeah. Even just how you held the brush and looking to the mirror and back to the page, it was, yeah, helpful to me. Made it less scary? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So the more I think about the, compa the actual thing, the mirror on the stick, the more I think it's a communication tool, you can begin to sort of empathise with what I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. Like when you um, came to me and then you told me what to do, you helped, you showed me like, yeah. then I kind of, I knew what you were saying, I knew like, I just, I understood it. I didn't know how, but I did. There are students there who have no confidence in their work whatsoever, who came away after that one short session feeling good about what they had done. Shortening the distance between seeing and doing has opened painting up in the classroom. Rather than the quick click of a photograph, this is image making by hand. And if taught in a nuanced way, it becomes accessible to everyone. Which puts us in a unique position, I think. It took probably about five to ten minutes for them to actually get into the swing of it of actually using it to follow where the shapes were, follow where the colours were. That is quite interesting to me and quite magical I suppose because actually that's something that we spend years trying to teach and in the space of like ten minutes they're going, well actually no I can do this. My aim has always been to try to see if the comparator mirror would make the skills of observational, realistic drawing and painting accessible to everyone without changing them. And it seems that it does. But most significantly of all, I've had the privilege of being able to hold students who were ready to quit right at the place where decisions are made, begin to aggregate, and it becomes possible to return to an intimacy toward art and toward looking, which in the age of digital and mechanical photographic reproduction, we thought we had lost. Understanding painting as a process of decisions and teaching it as such, you begin to foster a sense that what really matters about art is not the trick of making a realistic looking picture. And that what's really at stake with paint is the chance to see or to make the most intimate record of human thought. Whether a painting looks like this, or like this, that thought is all there to be discovered in the picture surface. 
If we can look without a sense of awe, and we have a reason to empathise, which now, I think, we do. And to return to my earlier point, who knows what effect that empathy will have on the gap. Thanks very much for watching. I'd like to send a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's become involved in this project since the very beginning through this YouTube channel. Despite the US postal system getting in the way occasionally, you have been the lifeblood of this work from the very beginning, and I cannot thank you enough. I must also thank Tim Jennison, whose help and support have allowed this project to flourish in the way that you've seen here. Based on the successes you've seen in this video, Tim and I are setting up a company. Painting Lab won't be designed to teach anyone anything directly about art, but instead I'm going to try to build it around the questions that many people seem to want to ask about beauty, the relevance of what galleries and museums are doing, and about their own creative ability. And at the centre of all this is going to be a fully accessible, commercially available comparator mirror kit. And I'll be showing you all the work I've been doing on that front in my next video. Things are moving really fast at this point. It's a wonderfully exciting time. And if you'd like to be part of it, just subscribe to this channel, click the notification bell, or drop me an email to pre-order a comparator mirror kit with the subject heading pre-order. You can also send me any questions and ideas you might have at that email address. Thanks again for taking the time to watch this video to the very end. I hope it's been informative and uh, fascinating in the way that it has been to me. And until next time, see you next time.